Well, we just spent a day and a half researching video game patents so that you don't have to. Here's what's going on. After years of trying, Warner Brothers have been successful in securing a patent for the Nemesis system. Of course, that's the cornerstone of their two Middle Earth games. Now, that was responsible for the procedurally generated named orcs with specific personalities and traits who would remember their player interactions. And basically, between the dialogue, the actions, and the combat and the changes to their attributes, they could react to a humongous amount of what you could do as a player in that game. Now, you then combine that with loads of unique, handcrafted personalities to pick from, and yeah, Shadow of War was mostly driven by stories that each player had with a few orcs that acted as kind of totally unique characters for their game. It was really cool. A wonderfully executed system that impacted the gameplay in so many ways. I think that game otherwise would have been average. Nemesis system made it great. And now that's been successfully patented. So you might think, no other developer can use it, right? I mean, hell, we, a pack of newbie indies, may even have ran foul of it. And to illustrate that, you'll see one of our uh, studio's games later on towards the end of this video. Because it impacts everybody, potentially. So, does this spell an end to procedural enemy generation? Have Warner Bros. just locked away one of the best avenues for emergent narrative design that we've really seen in a game? Well, to answer that, we're going to need to talk about patents, what Warner Brothers already secured, and a whole lot more. Now, to make a very long story nice and short for you, they've secured a patent on the following, right? Now, let's go. Changing a second NPC's parameters and status based on interactions between a player-controlled character and a first NPC. Now, this can be basically anything, right? Appearance, dialogue, gameplay stats, the whole works. And secondly, this specifically includes the second NPC status within a faction or a hierarchy of NPCs with game data stored locally or on a server for sharing across independent game sessions. Now, in oversimplified terms, right, it looks like they've patented changing an NPC status and their place within a hierarchy when something happens to any NPC in a video game. Pretty broad? Sounds insane, you might think. And in a way... It kind of is. Is this some kind of joke? I killed you already. And that's what we're going to break down in today's video. Okay, right. Patreon, it's the way to support what we're doing and also get a bunch of really cool stuff. You will get the shield pin, a bunch of dope art as well. And also, just a quick note, right, today's video. We could have got this out earlier, faster. Yes, we could have. But we spent a full day and a half on research for this one, going really deep into video game patents and the case law and the precedents and all of that stuff. Our goal is to do the story best, not to do it first. And uh, that obviously runs completely foul of um, how to succeed on YouTube, where being the first one off the line, and I'm not saying that in a disparaging way, it's how I've run things for the, the longest time. Um, but, you know, that's what YouTube really wants you to do. But what we want to do is really to dive into these stories and to enjoy the process of researching them and learning them so that we can then cover the news for you, but also make you come away from our videos, hopefully being a little bit smarter, right? Actually learning some new stuff. So patrons, I hope you enjoy the, the cool stuff that we send your way. And also, thank you for allowing us to do this. Let's go. Killed you? Now you're back? Just my rotten luck. That all sounded worrying, but here's why you probably have nothing to worry about from a legal perspective. The debate that this has sparked off has been focused on the idea that Warner Brothers patented a game mechanic. Now, there's truth to be found in the questions that people are asking. If you can patent this, then why has nobody patented the first-person shooter or the grappling hook in a platformer? Well, patents are not designed to protect ideas or results. They're designed to protect methods and systems. And that means it's extremely difficult to patent a game mechanic, but you can patent a very specific implementation of a game mechanic, of an idea. And that's what they've done here. So to clear this up, we're going to look at two other game patents because there's, well, two pretty notable exceptions that prove the rule. Dynasty Warriors, right? Dynasty Warriors patented 
changing attack and defense values based on friendly NPCs nearby, and changing the character's color to indicate it. Yeah, buffs. They patented buffs working in that way. Crazy Taxi. So Crazy Taxi patented a floating arrow on screen directing the player in an open world city driving game, but one that also has pedestrians jump out of the way of cars to prevent cruel game images. Now this one actually had Sega suing EA over this patent because of a game many of us played as kids, The Simpsons Road Rage. And to be fair, it does look kind of identical. Now, they settled out of court for an undisclosed amount, so we never actually had a legal ruling to set precedent here, right? This bit did not make case law because it was settled out of court. Now, this brings us to an important legal note, actually. So, confirmed by a ruling in a 2007 case, patents are only infringed in their totality as we may have seen with the Crazy Taxi and uh, The Simpsons if it ever actually went to court, but of course it didn't. Now what that means is that you're only infringing if you do everything in a patent. If you leave out some parts, basically you're fine. Now there's a fantastic example of this that we found in our research. Harmonix, okay, that's the company known for Guitar Hero, Rock Band, and Dance Central. They have a lot of patents about music and games. And one that really jumps out to us is the patent for a musical combat game um, that's from their cancelled title called Chroma. And reading through that patent, it sounds a hell of a lot like a recent indie game, an awesome one by the way, called Bullets Per Minute, right? That rhythm-based shooter that looks like a rhythm game and Doom that's really cool. That fits a massive portion of Harmonix's patent. However, the criteria laid out are so exhaustive that BPM isn't even close to infringing, despite how, at a glance, it looks like it would be in violation of the patent. There's also Bioware. They patented their dialogue wheel, and they passed that over to EA. And that has obviously not stopped anybody else in similar games using similar dialogue systems. Hell, everyone's favorite wacky auteur, Kojima, holds a few patents himself from Snake Eater to Death Stranding, bunch of stuff patented. Now, by comparison, Warner Brothers' patent is very broad, but the spirit behind it is, I think, clear in these examples. Patents are not rare in this industry, not by a long shot, but given the Nemesis system's popularity, a whole bunch of attention has came to this case. Now, the same goes for the recently publicized patent on a game called The Medium. It's one of the Xbox uh, sort of big exclusives. And that patented dual world gameplay, right? It refers to the implementation of their character synchronization layer and modified inputs across story universes. And not the idea of dual world gameplay. My first university project in first year was a like a platformer where you would basically shift between the regular universe and the mirror universe, right? You could see that as dual world gameplay. And while it may seem like it would totally run afoul of that patent, it actually wouldn't because it's not running afoul of that patent in totality. The real intention um, of these patents is to do things like stop employees leaving and remaking the same system bit by bit elsewhere or, you know, stop reverse engineering or blatant copycats. That's kind of the vibe. It's not really to cover general similar stuff in the games industry. Now, adding more fuel to the anti-Warner Brothers fire, and of course it's Warner Brothers, I mean, they're pretty detestable a lot of the time, uh, but there's also a concept in patent law that is called prior art. So let's talk about that. It means that patents are invalid if the thing you're patenting has existed at least a year before the patent application. And here's the funny thing, more than a few come to mind. In Dark Souls from 2011, if you kill the illusion of Guinevere, the Dark Moon faction of NPCs changes to become hostile. What is that? Well, that involves an interaction with an NPC that changes the status of a faction and NPCs within it. Kind of similar to that patent. Crusader Kings 2, which has got a highly complex NPC and, you know, faction interactions, was released in 2012, three years before this patent was applied for. Crusader Kings 2 was even used as an example in uh, many of the times where Warner Brothers tried to patent this and got rejected. 
If it's demonstrable that a hierarchy of NPCs like the Nemesis system was in a game from before 2014, then this patent is a massive non-issue for anyone in the industry. Thanks to prior art, if you're seeking to patent anything in a game's design, you're probably too late, because someone's probably already done it. Both the legal and cultural side will provide pushback. So broadly speaking, there's a ton of weaknesses here, right? We already have examples of games doing similar things, like Assassin's Creed, Mercenaries, and Odyssey, Watch Dogs, Legions, uh, NPC system. The only time Warner Bros. could likely prove you were infringing their patent is if you specifically set out to make a carbon copy of the Nemesis system in, in every which way. But between totality of claims and prior art, you would be hard-pressed to patent anything in games that's not hyper-specific and unique, which, uh, yeah, is the point of patents in the first place. Just in case you're feeling too cheery, we do have to cover the bad side of this story, because what we just said is not really the entire story. For Warner Brothers, this is a very big and expensive legal stick that they can use to beat people with. A Riot staffer, as an example, who used to work in an indie, put this extremely well, and they said, It probably would not be legally enforceable, but I and other indie devs don't have the money to find out. Yeah, it's Warner Bros. You don't have the money to fight their lawyers. This is something we've seen before. Namco, from 1998 to 2005, held a patent on, um, well, including auxiliary games in loading screens. But here's the thing, this patent specifically refers to loading code from a CD-ROM, a practice which more or less ended in the early 2000s. So, despite that, we never saw mini games and loading screens at all. We maybe got training segments of full gameplay like in Bayonetta or FIFA, but it's probably worth noting that uh, the patent shouldn't have been granted in the first place because Invader Load did the same thing from a compact uh, from compact uh, cassette tapes in 1987 on the Commodore 64. So it's a bit weird, but still, that patent was only covering a CD-ROM, technically speaking, so we could have been having loading screen minigames for a long time. For another example, and one that's still active, Nintendo still holds a patent for, the, um, for a specific sanity system from Eternal Darkness, where basically the game would cause a low sanity character to hallucinate over audio effects and a whole bunch more. Realistically, neither of these patents are likely to have held up in court, and uh, we haven't even discussed how weak software patents in general are. So the point is, these things have not been challenged, right? The patents existing has been enough to deter developers from trying their luck, right? And based on the headlines and the discussion around this patent, it could very well happen again this time. So even if the legal stuff is utter BS and will never be enforced by these companies, the whole point is that there's a chilling effect and that people won't dare to find out because, especially in the American legal system, with I believe how court fees and stuff work, yeah, you cannot afford to fight them. The real danger here is that anyone working on an emergent narrative or gameplay system could receive a very scary letter in the mail from Warner Brothers, threatening them to stop or face a lawsuit. Warner Brothers would be extremely unlikely to win any infringement cases, but the sheer cost of fighting with Warner Brothers' legions of lawyers would be extremely high, and that would mean that nobody outside of AAA would have the cash to do it. If an indie gets a letter like that, they're going to crumble under the pressure. And we're going to use our own studio as an example here, and there's some pretty, uh, pretty, I don't know, pretty dope news to give you in the next, uh, in the next bunch of months. But we're going to wind back the clock a little bit because one of our older projects was called How to Kill Monsters. It was originally called How to Kill Monsters Influence People when it was a bigger game, but we scoped it down, and our vision for that was, uh, well, it had elements very inspired by the Nemesis system. Basically, right, you're making your own mechs. There is enemy kaiju out throughout the world, and uh, we decided to make it so there was a very small number of kaiju, but that you would fight each kaiju many, many, many times. And based on the specific ways that you would fight them, they would change their fighting style. They could grow afraid of you, they could lose specific limbs in battle, they would stop using attacks if they never worked. If you lost to them in battle, then they would repurpose parts of your mech to use as their own weapons and armor, or perhaps even gain new abilities and become more confident in battle. And these changes would impact the other kaiju as well. 
Yeah, suffice to say, we bit off more than we could chew. We realized that this was just a game that would cost us probably half a million that we didn't have, obviously. So we had to scrap it. But we basically felt that we could, you know, go for a roguelike game with loads and loads and loads of enemies, or we could do a same roguelike game, but have a very small number, a very cool kaiju that you would develop relationships with um, between your many different runs of the game, right? It would all sort of grow with your save file. I think it would have been pretty sweet. Um, now, our implementation would have been massively different from the Nemesis system, but it obviously would have been inspired by the Nemesis system. And that's how a lot of games work, right? We all build on top of innovations that we all make and everybody contributes. Now, if we had shown this off in marketing and then we got a letter telling us we'd have to stop, what would we do, right? I can tell you for a fact in the indie sphere, you know, when you get a publishing deal, um, you get enough money to cover your burn rate, and then hopefully a little bit more, right? To give you some safety, some float. That doesn't include a humongous legal budget. So, any indie, even an indie who's not bootstrapping and who has received publishing money, they would not be able to fight something like this, even if it was a case where they would win. At least, you know, in many of the legal systems, especially legal systems, where a case like this would play out. And that's the issue here. The outcome or legality does not really matter if Warner Brothers can basically use this patent as a warning flag and produce a chilling effect, right? Don't copy our thing, we could totally come after you. And if this sounds familiar, then it's the same problem we've all been facing from DMCA's and abusive copyright law, where the deck is stacked against those who cannot engage or cannot afford to engage with the legal system. The patents are not the problem. Legal tools and their potential misuses are, and how you can, I think, use the specificity and stuff of the law to kind of go against the spirit of things. At least that's my vibe of it, if I'm going to inject some personal opinion. Now, as for the likelihood of Warner Brothers actually going after anyone, I don't think it's likely. Uh, you know, if we catch somebody abusing this, or them abusing this, it's going to be a very bad look for them. But to be honest, it's Warner Brothers games. They obviously don't care about their reputation. Their repeated awful behavior in games is uh, obvious proof of that. But if they see something, they think it's a threat, and they want to use this patent stick to boink them with, they totally can. The real reason, I would say, is that they don't actually, or the real reason we probably won't see much here, is they don't have much to gain from attacking other developers, especially the indies and the people who they could actually successfully attack. Fighting an indie easy, fighting Ubisoft, mm, expensive, not something you want to lose in court. And indies are not going to impact the sales of Warner Bros. games, so I don't think there's really any compelling reason for them to waste time or money uh, threatening them. Also, it would be rich, since Warner Brothers were sued by Bethesda for ripping off uh, Fallout Shelter wholesale. So that's the story. It's spicy. It's interesting. It got us all talking. We all learned a bit more about patent law. But it's also probably nothing, even though it does have the potential to be quite a bad thing. Warner Brothers patenting with such broad language, though, that's dangerous enough. Yeah, I think it will deter some developers from making similar hierarchical NPC systems, uh, whether or not Warner Bros. would actually do anything about it. And it is a shame, because the patent system does mostly go unabused within games. And also, at the end of the day, here's an important thing. The Nemesis system was not good because the implementation was technically great, or anything like that. Yeah, it involves making systems like that, but it's really not that hard, okay? That was a really good system because Monolith fed content into it that was good. They spent time making sure the dialogue was awesome, the events were fun, and the orc personalities were memorable and unique. It was that unique human work that was the actual quality. The Nemesis system was just the technical thing that imp you know, was required to implement and to execute upon a good design that had good content made for it. So remember that, you know, a lot of game developers, including me in the past, and this is wasted, you know, I, I've wasted a lot of money on this. We sometimes think that, you know, our games are just our systems and things like that. And no, it's the experience. It's how it emotionally resonates with the player. And you look at the Nemesis system, it's not just the system. It's all of the heart that Monolith actually put into that system's content. Okay. If this deeper look into such a hot topic has been educational and you enjoyed it, 
please let us know. This is a time where I could have sat down here, I could have ad-libbed something probably 30 minutes after the news broke. We could have written a regular report probably 90 minutes to two and a half hours after the news broke. And you could have been watching a significantly worse version of this video days ago. But the way that we're doing things these days is we, we're all growing a bit older and we don't want to just be sitting there doing that. We want to be able to spend more time on these videos, on the research, so we can all get more smart together and we're not just, uh, you know, feeding into a kind of outrage cycle with the content that we make. So if you do like content like this and you would like to allow us to spend more time doing videos like this um, while still being able to keep everybody, you know, paid. Um, and also you're getting some pretty damn cool stuff in return in Patreon then. Patreon is the place. Um, as we move into the next phase of this channel, for me, it is about the quality of content. It is about longer form projects. We have a long form project on the way soon and a few pretty cool ones penned in after that. Uh, then Patreon is the place because I think the more you break free of the advertisement model, the more that you are free to make content that is, well, I think more pure, right? So thank you. Let me know what you think. See you next time.